Today we're going to be talking about perhaps one of the best psychological horror or thriller animes that's come out in a while. And when you take a genre here and there like that and you kind of throw in different elements here and there from different stories like perhaps Prison Break, which isn't an anime, but it still has different elements over here for this one, and also throw in like a little bit of an Attack on Titan type of deal, you're actually setting yourself up for a recipe for success. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Danger Doug, and today we're going to be talking about The Promised Neverland. And although we're not exactly talking about the entirety of The Promised Neverland because Season 2 is actually actively coming out right now, we're just going to be talking about The Accepted Season 1. The first season of The Promised Neverland spans about 12 episodes and it includes a lot of the stuff that was adapted from the manga series that was written by Kaio Shirai and essentially made its debut around, I want to say, January to April 2019. Now, the show itself has been licensed by Aniplex and is available in the US and Canada over in different stream platforms like Netflix and Crunchyroll. I personally watched it in Crunchyroll myself, but... For all intents and purposes, it's about 12 episodes, and again, for a lot of you guys out there, you could binge this one in a weekend, but it's one of those things where I'm kind of like, you probably shouldn't, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of the episodes are kind of traumatizing in some way, shape, or fashion. Now, okay, for a lot of you guys who are actually used to the horror genre and actually see these things all the time, you might be able to binge this in a weekend, but for most folks out there, I actually think that for a lot of the different trauma that the characters find themselves in that you probably should actually take this in different little bite size like type increments and probably watch this over a couple of different weekends instead of like just all in one weekend. Some of the episodes get absolutely crazy and it's one of those things where I think instead of like binging it in like a certain weekend or like on a Saturday afternoon you probably should just kind of let it sink in a little bit and just kind of like take a couple of weekends to kind of like realize okay what just happened and all the good stuff what are we finding ourselves in, and uh, how are the kids going to handle this one going forward? That's the way that I would recommend you watch this show. And before we get into the main character section of my review, I'd just like to point out that the manga for this particular series has sold over 26 million copies over in Japan and worldwide here and there, making it perhaps one of the best-selling manga series of all time. It has received acclaim from fans and critics worldwide and has also like garnered multiple awards here and there from Crunchyroll, including one in particular that I actually would like to point out maybe when we get into our main character section, which is Best Antagonist. Not too bad if I do say so myself, but let's get the conversation rolling by talking about our main characters. Now, there are 38 different children here and there which make up Gracefield House in our particular setting and whatnot, but I'm only going to be really discussing about three of those kids, and I'm pretty sure if you've already seen this anime, you probably already know which three I'm actually going to be discussing. But the first one that I want to bring up is actually Emma. Now, of the three main children of the group, and again, all three of them are very highly intelligent and super smart, but when you take a look at Emma's character over here, you realize very quickly that she's kind of like the heart or the moral compass of the group. She's kind of like that big sister figure for a lot of the children. It's one of those things where if you get like a lot of the kids out there who are trying to um like go out and play and stuff, she's kind of leading a lot of the conversations and stuff and just kind of like going at it. But she has a heart in comparison to the other two. Not that the other two don't have a heart, but she's kind of like that driving force here and there as being like the moral compass of the trio. So for a lot of the decisions that get made, whether it's playtime here and there or their daring escape later on when we get to it, she's always seeing as trying to make sure that everybody is okay and that everybody is actually just cared for and that they actually don't uh, not include anybody else that they're trying to actually get into with this daring escape. And that's when we get to our next main character who is Norman. Now Norman, in addition to being like super smart with the other two and whatnot, he's actually seen more so as like the strategist of the trio. So in terms of like collecting data here and there or like planning or trying to see exactly like how they can make their daring escape, Norman's one of the guys at the forefront who essentially is kind of leading a lot of the stuff from reconnaissance missions to kind of checking around exactly like seeing exactly what can be used in an escape or perhaps maybe distractions for finding out more information. He also has a little bit of a crush on Emma and all of the good stuff, which is very, very cute, but I'm very happy that they didn't take it in such a way to where like they pushed a romance on us. And again, these kids are also like 11 or something like that, so it would have been kind of weird, but at the same time, he does have feelings for her. Now again, as Emma is the moral compass of the group and you have Norman over here who is kind of like the strategist of the group, we get to our next main character who essentially is kind of like the wild card in the situation, who is Ray. Now even though Ray is very, very highly intelligent in his own right and whatnot, he's kind of one of those guys who's kind of like acting almost as like a double agent or a triple agent of the group, which is kind of a weird setup here and there when you take a look at the story for what it is. There's a little bit of a twist to this and whatnot, and we find out that Ray is actually kind of working for Mother is Isabella, who is kind of essentially running Gracefield House and whatnot. So not only is he spying on her, he's also spying on his other compadres over here, Norman and Emma. 
and trying to relay information back and forth from each other. He's one of those characters who just kind of like almost accepts their fate to where it's like, you know what, we really can't do anything. I mean, what are us kids going to do? Which in hindsight, it's like, what can these kids actually really honestly do? But at the same time, it's one of those things too where it's like, okay, if you want to avoid your fate of being killed here and there, he strikes a deal with Mother Isabella in order to try to make sure that he can save himself. Which segues into our next main character who is Mother Isabella, and she is something else. Now again, Mother Isabella won Best Antagonist in 2019 for several different reasons, but one of the biggest ones is just the fact that she not only keeps the peace over Gracefield House, but she effectively has been lying to the kids all along about where they've been going here and there when they get supposedly adopted, and they get adopted and then they get shipped off over here to be eaten by the demons. But this is just the tip of the iceberg with her character. I mean, essentially, like when we see throughout the entire series, just how far this woman is willing to go here and there to not only keep the peace, but also to kind of backstab and kind of set up the kids or try to make sure that they kind of get their false sense of security here and there, even though they very obviously cannot leave this whole entire compound, she tries to keep them all from leaving anyway. And do the kids actually figure it out? Hmm, you'll just have to wait and watch and see. And that leads me to our last main character who is Sister Crone, and she is kind of another wild card that is introduced into the middle of the season, who kind of like throws things for a little bit of a loop here and there as well. And when we first meet Sister Crone's character in the show, essentially it's kind of like implied here and there that she's being set up to be like kind of groomed to be another mother over another house. She is well aware of the shadow organization, which is kind of pulling the strings in the background and just how evil all this stuff is, but she has to kind of save face, especially when just kind of like going into a lot of the stuff over here to try to actually be promoted to the rank of mother, because if you weren't actually promoted to that kind of rank, apparently I guess the demons will kill you. But as the show progresses here and there, we kind of see her being used as a pawn here and there by Mother Isabella in order to spy on the kids here and there and kind of report and relay information back. One thing does come into a head towards like the middle end of the show to where we find out that not only does she see this as wrong, but she's also kind of kind of helping the kids out in such a way here and there. Again, won't spoil it for you, but at the same time, just know that her character is not necessarily all one dimension as you might think it's at the start. And now that we've introduced the main characters over to you, let's talk about the plot and the storyline of The Promised Neverland. So we start off set in the year 2045, which really is not that far off, you guys. I mean, it's what, 24 years into the future now? We meet Emma, who's an 11-year-old orphan who's living at Gracefield House. And Gracefield House is kind of the self-contained orphanage. It's just kind of like, it's lush, it's green, it's got woods and trees and plenty of space for the kids to kind of play around and whatnot. The kids are kind of fed, they're taught here and there in different classes here and there, and basically have all their accommodations met. The caretaker, whose name is Isabella, is kind of seen as the mother of the entire group and whatnot, and essentially just kind of like in charge of just kind of running things from day to day, whether it's chores or classes or something like that for the kids. But at the same time, we see that a lot of the different kids over there are pretty much housed until about age 12. And around age 12, we see that a lot of the orphan kids are basically picked up and adopted by certain parents and whatnot. But there's one thing that happens to one of these kids to which Emma and her friend Norman witnesses, and it's not very good. So Emma's friend Connie is the first one to be adopted in the series in the first episode. And essentially, as Emma sees Connie leave and whatnot, Emma realizes that she left her stuffed bunny over here at the orphanage house. Not wanting to see Connie off without her little bunny, Emma actually goes and gets the bunny and tries to go out and see exactly what she can do about returning it to Connie before she goes off to meet her parents. And as soon as Emma and Norman, who tags along with her, catches up to her and whatnot, they find out that Connie has been killed at the gate. And as Emma and Norman witness her death in front of her, they also realize that these demons devour her and they learn the harsh truth about what the Gracefield house actually is. So taking this knowledge back, Emma and Norman just kind of go back to the Gracefield house, just kind of horrified and saying, we've got to escape. They realize that every single one of the kids over there is just being kept and raised over there pretty much as livestock for these demons who are essentially going out and devouring them pretty much when they reach age 12. So the two of them together, along with a newcomer, Ray over here, who kind of like gets into the entire mix and whatnot, hatches a plan here and there to try to escape with everybody. Now Norman and Ray come to the realization that, okay, we have kids who are essentially four years old and younger and whatnot, we probably won't be able to make our daring escape 
while trying to carry all of those ones in tow. However, Emma strongly objects to this one as the moral compass of the trio and whatnot, she's trying to make sure that none of this happens to any of the kids ever again in the future. Now, throughout the rest of the show, we see a lot of different attempts for them to try to gather information, either from Ray as a spy or trying to actually go around the entire compound and trying to learn about their surroundings and whatnot. But we also see like different attempts over there to try to thwart the kids over here from Mother Isabella and Sister Crone. The clash between the kids and their captors is perhaps one of the most captivating things about the entire show, as you see the kids who are very, very determined to actually make their escape, but at the same time, a lot of the captors over here come to the realization that this whole thing is wrong in the first place, but the driving force of them like still like going along with it anyway is that yes, they'll still be killed if they don't actually comply with the giant like shadow organization of demons that's trying to keep order around all of this. And although I won't spoil the ending for a lot of you guys, I will say there's a lot of different revelations that come up throughout the show to where you see and learn like different parts of kids' relationships with each other, but also with their captors as well. And with that, let's talk about the production quality and the soundtrack of this particular anime. The studio that handled The Promised Neverland was actually Cloverworks, and those guys did an absolutely phenomenal job with this one. Since this season was only about 12 episodes, the production team over at Cloverworks was able to do a whole lot in terms of rendering 3D space and also giving the characters a whole lot of ranges of emotions as the rest of the scenes were going on. One of the biggest positives for me in this particular production was its use of light and dark here and there in a lot of the scenes, and especially so for a lot of the scenes here and there where the kids are just kind of like at night trying to plan here and there and come together and just kind of report about what's going on over at the orphanage. Again, the light is also symbolic over here with a lot of the kids just kind of surrounded by a whole dark world that they live in with the candle of their light just trying to see exactly what can do about bringing knowledge to the rest of the group and also trying to plan and coordinate their efforts to escape. And in addition to that, the opening and closing songs for this particular anime are absolutely wonderful, but also the music scores that go out through the entire show are very appropriate placed, especially for the mood and the setting of each one of the scenes that the characters finds himself in. And now, let's discuss my conclusion for The Promised Neverland. After watching the show and also getting excited to watch Prison Break and Attack on Titan again and whatnot, I award The Promised Neverland the score a 4.4 out of 5 stars, putting it into my masterclass recommending that you absolutely watch this anime. And not only watch it, but I actually recommend that you guys buy this for your collection as I think that this one is going to be an essential one for sure. The mood, the setting, the interactions with all the different characters over here, including the main trio, has got me captivated, especially after watching it over the course of a couple of different weekends. One of the things that was really hung up on over here is that these kids are supposed to be 11 and they're solving very, very complex problems that not too many adults that I know would be able to solve themselves. Not that a lot of the adults that I know are not smart, a lot of them are very smart, but at the same time in this particular type of setting, even though the kids are supposed to be geniuses, I'm like, okay, this is kind of like complex critical thinking and espionage activities here and there that I would expect that many adults to not be able to grasp themselves. But despite that one hang up, it's one of those things where when you start watching the show, you realize just how crazy it's going to get within the first episode. But does it let up from there? No, it actually keeps going with this one, and it climaxes at just all the right moments. There is a little bit of a lull period here and there in the middle here and there to where it's like, are we going to actually see something crazy or whatnot? Or is it just going to fizzle out into nothingness? But trust me, once you get past like a little bit of the kind of dull middle ground and whatnot, the rest of it not only starts to make sense, but it gets into a fully realized story. Even though you can kind of guess here and there about the little twists and turns here and there that go on with the kids as they kind of figure out exactly what the hell is going on, um, it's one of those things where it reaches a satisfying conclusion at the very end, even though it may not necessarily be everything that you've ever wanted. And before I go off saying anything more about this whole thing, I will say that you should definitely check out this show, and if you have already, make sure you leave a comment down in the comment section below as to what your thoughts on this were. That's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to leave this video a like and hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell for notifications. Also, be sure to check out some of our other anime reviews over here as well, and definitely get ready for this winter season as we get our lore watch parties going. And with that, I will see you soon in the next video. Take care, you guys.